Hi, my name is Jordan Jew, and this is my dad, Daniel. We'll be reading today's scripture, uh, which comes from, chap- from Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Please give your attention to the reading of God's word. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Order men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God would not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Amen. And now let's give your attention to the preaching of God's word. Well, it's very fitting that we have a father and son combo to do that scripture reading as we have a very special guest pastor to speak to us again in this season. Our very own pastor, Daniel Denko Kim, who joins us today. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he is leading a church plant, uh, and he is the lead church planting pastor of Kindred Presbyterian Church. Uh, he is this Kindred Presbyterian is a church plant here from Mother Church of Christ Central, and Pastor Daniel Kim served here on staff at Christ Central for 13 years. He's married to Priscilla. They have a beautiful daughter named Emery. And uh, as we welcome him up, it's not just another guest pastor. He's one of our dear family members. We want to welcome Pastor Daniel Denko Kim. Thank you for uh, what I believe was the manliest scripture reading I've ever witnessed in my whole life. Well, as thank you for the introduction. My name is Daniel, pastor of Kindred, and I do bring uh, greetings and affection from your daughter church, and it's always such a pleasure for me personally to uh, to bring the word of God to here at Christ Central to, you know, what what always feels like home whenever I'm here, and uh, I do want to continue to ask for prayer for Kindred and especially for Kindred's members, our leaders, uh, that. We would continue to help people find belonging in the gospel. Definitely appreciate your continued prayers for our church. Uh, Speaking of kindred, though, um, there is a little motto I like to say here and there to our church. I've said it prior to our launch and even post-launch. And, of course, I'm not the first person to ever say this at a church. But I like to say, we did not launch a church service but we launched a church. And there is a difference, right? We, we didn't begin Kindred to launch a Sunday service, and that's it, as important as Sunday service is. But we began Kindred to launch a church, to launch a community of believers, to launch all that that entails to be a church. And of course, this doesn't just apply to Kindred. This applies to all churches, as we do see in Titus chapter 2. Titus is a letter from the Apostle Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit to a younger pastor named Titus out in Crete. He's serving out in Crete. And in this letter, and especially in chapter 2, what we just read or what was just read for you, you probably noticed that Apostle Paul starts off by saying, teach what accords with sound or healthy doctrine. Teach good doctrine." But then he immediately goes into how this community is to relate to one another, how they are to teach one another, how they are to have an influence on one another, namely the older to the younger, older men to younger men, older women to younger women, to the next generation. And it is quite fitting. It's my understanding that at least some members of the next generation uh, of the youth are, are in this service as well. And you know, sometimes there's this discussion amongst church leaders where we pit two things against each other. We pit content and community 
kind of against each other. We say, you know, is it all about content? Is it all about a good sermon, good songs in this day and age, a good social media post? Or is it about community? Is it about relationships? Is it about discipleship? Is it about small groups? And of course, you probably know the answer is it's both. We need both, right? We need both content and community, or to be more specific, good, healthy, biblical content and good, healthy, biblical community. Content without community leads to consumerism, right? If, if all I care about is just getting that good sermon, getting that good experience, getting that good Sunday experience without the community, then I am just a consumer at the end of the day. I just need to get my spiritual fix, get my spiritual uh, encouragement, coaching, what have you, and then I move on. We need community too. On the flip side, community without content, without good biblical content, at best is a club, at worst is a cult, especially if we're talking unbiblical, bad teaching and content. And the idea, of course, is we need both. All of the book of Titus makes clear we need both. We need to be healthy in both. We need to be sound in both. But in our passage in Titus 2, I would say the focus, of course, is on healthy community. He starts by saying, teach what accords to healthy doctrine, and then goes immediately into how we are to live, how we are to influence one another, especially older to younger. In verses 7 and 8 of our text, Titus is encouraged to show himself in all respects to be a model of good works, of good integrity, of dignity, of good speech. And of course, the implication is all these descriptions of what older men are to be like, what older women are to be like, are also models for the younger men and younger women. This word here, model, can quite literally just mean a mark, like a Literally a visible impression made by pressure or a blow. That's why this word can even be uh, used to talk about footprints or a seal on a stamp. Or sorry, a seal on a letter or on a certificate. The idea is we are called as God's people to leave that gospel impression, to leave that gospel mark, to be gospel influencers, if you will. Of course, you don't have to have hundreds of thousands of followers on your social media account, and yet we are still called to be influencers to our younger brothers and sisters, to our next generation, to your own children too, of course, if you have children. But really, as the church, we are called to be that, whether or not you have children. And we need the church to be this community of models, this community of influencers. There's this statistic, I actually shared this with CCSC uh, maybe three years ago, but it's worth sharing again. This is from 2017 from the Pew Forum. And they interviewed many people to ask them their reasons for going to church. And here are the top three answers. First was to become closer with God. The second one was, so children will have a moral foundation. I'm sure we've heard that one a lot. And then the third, the, the third one out of the top three was, to make me a better person. Now, as you look at these three reasons to go to church, of course, none of those three in and of themselves are bad or wrong or in any way, right? These are good reasons to go to church. But I think the glaring omission is there's no community in here. There's no relationships in here. There's no modeling. There's no influencing in here, other than perhaps just for my own children, my own little island. I'm sure you've noticed that this is from 2017, which is, of course, pre-pandemic. And I would hope that if, we, if Pew, the Pew Forum interviewed folks now, post-pandemic, perhaps these answers would be a little different because that pandemic... That, that thing that happened that, that is still kind of surreal, it really showed us, if anything, how much we need community, how much we need more than just good content, as important, important as good content is. We need one another 
We need to be learning from one another. We need to be leaving that gospel impression, that gospel influence on one another. You know, there's this play written by the Christian playwright Dorothy Sayers where a young man is asked, what is your creed? And he responds by saying, oh, I don't adhere to a particular creed. I adhere to my own creed, my own personal creed, not like, you know, to the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. I adhere to my own creed. It's personal to me. And an older, wiser person responds to him by saying, Basically, I'm paraphrasing here. Even the voice with which you say that is the voice of your city. It's the voice of your church. It's the voice of the people around you. Point being, even when we like to think, oh yeah, I follow my own personal creed. Uh, You know, I, I march to the beat of my own drum. We have to admit we are influenced by others. We are influenced by the people who came before us. We are influenced by the people we listen to, the people we admire. You know, there's a common criticism of people who hold to religious faith where, you know, people will say, you know, you're only Christian because... Your family's Christian. Your parents are Christian. And that's why you're a Christian. You've probably heard that before. I've heard it before. And quite simply, we know that's not always true, right? I'm sure, I know for a fact, actually, even here at Christ Central, uh, there are folks who became Christians despite having non-Christian parents or families. And they became Christians later in their lives. And so we know that's not necessarily true. Oh, you're just a Christian because your family is Christian. But on the flip side, I also want to say, if you did grow up in a Christian household, so what? So what if that's why you are a Christian? That is the grace of God. That is a blessing of God, his faithfulness to you, that through your Christian household, you have faith now today. For myself personally, I have to admit that I am a product of my grandmother's prayers. I am a product of my mom teaching me about Jesus at a young age. I am a product of my older sister teaching me specifically about the reformed faith when all I wanted to do was smoke cigarettes and be a tough guy. She she was telling me all about reformed theology. I was like, what is this? But it was planting great seeds for the gospel. I am a product of my pastors. I am a product of my brothers and sisters who have had an influence on me. We have to be able to admit that. And even the atheist or the agnostic or someone who is not a Christian must admit they are a product of the people they follow, the people they listen to, the people who have influence over them. We all have to admit we are far more impressionable than we'd like to admit. We are easier to influence than we'd like to admit. And so the the key is, who are the influences? Who are the influencers that you bring into your life, that you bring into your heart? And the Bible's point, Titus's point, or Apostle Paul to Titus's point, is not only choose your influences well, choose your models well, but to go further, be an influence, be a model for the gospel, especially for the next generation. So how are we to do this? How are we to, what, what are we to model? Let's look more deeply into our passage. In verse two of our text, Apostle Paul addresses older men and he says this, older men are to be sober-minded, which can simply mean moderate or temperate. So it just means, you know, you don't go too hard on anything. Like, you don't go too extreme on anything. Alcohol included, but not just limited to alcohol. Dignified. I'm going to get it. I'm going to unpack that one a little more later. But just to say dignified means worthy of respect, which is a straightforward definition, right? But it can also mean serious or grave even. That there's a gravity about you. 
Now, of course, please don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that all older men of the church have to be so serious all the time. They can never joke. They can never have laughs. They can never, you know, have some levity in their lives. But Paul's point is, you got to be serious about something. You got to be grave even about certain things. Dignified, self-controlled, sound or healthy in faith, in love, in steadfastness, in endurance, in commitment to your church, to your family, to the people around you, to serving those around you. That's the steadfastness we want to see in older men. And really, we also have to admit, as we talk about older men, older women, that to a degree, it is kind of a relative, right? Um, you might be an older man to somebody, even though you're not necessarily that old. You might be a younger man, even though you're not necessarily that young. And the idea is, whether you're old or young, this is a beautiful picture of what we are to aspire to be. Not just to have these virtues, but to reflect who our God is. To reflect the seriousness, the beauty, the gravity of our gospel that we have through Christ. That's for the older men, but also for the older women. Apostle Paul gives this instruction. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior. Reverent in behavior. That phrase evokes the imagery of a priestess, where reverent in behavior can also be translated as uh, behavior fitting for the temple. I really like that because it's like, uh, whether or not you are in the temple, you act like you're in the temple. I love that, right? It, it makes me think of this Latin phrase, not that you have to know Latin, but uh, corum Deo, the face of God, that we are always before the face of God. Whether you're in the temple or not in the temple, whether you're at church or not at church, we are always before God. And therefore, I live reverently. I think this applies to women. This applies to men. Not slanderers or slaves to much wine. I, I read that uh, in ancient Crete, where Titus is serving, heavy drinking was viewed as a virtue, which is probably why Apostle Paul says this and also says, make sure the men, too, are temperate, moderate, sober-minded, which also can be sober, right? Uh, I think we're all not too unfamiliar with cultures in which heavy drinking is a virtue. Maybe you know about some cultures like that. Well, so was ancient Crete. Not to be slaves to wine, much wine. They are to teach what is good, train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands for the sake of their witness to the world, right? So that the word of God may not be reviled. Now, before, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't, before you get too put off by this language, right? Um, you know, if you feel like, well, this sounds very patriarchal. Well, of course, 2,000 years ago, it was a very patriarchal society. But what, what I want to convey to you is when read with the lens, understanding this is from 2,000 years ago, Apostle Paul is simply painting a picture of women who are thriving. And not and more importantly, not just women who are thriving, but women teaching other women how to thrive. Older women teaching younger women how to thrive. Just as a quick little encouraging side note, I do want to point out that part of that instruction is teaching, them, teaching the younger woman how to love their husbands and children. I think that's an interesting inclusion. Um, I want to encourage you. For you, if loving your husband and children is not the most natural thing. If for you, you're not, you don't quite feel like a super mom or an awesome wife, or for that matter, a super dad or an awesome husband, be encouraged that the scriptures make room for you to learn how to do this, to grow in this, to not be so great at it naturally right off the bat. But there is room for learning and being trained, encouraged to do these things. 
That word train actually can even just quite simply mean encourage. And of course, thriving in today's context for women, it doesn't just involve the home, being a wife or mother, although it doesn't exclude that either. But of course, there are many areas of life in which our older women can encourage our younger women uh, by sharing their wisdom on, on all sorts of facets of life, the workplace, navigating friendships, what have you. All this to say, there is a call. There is a call to reach, to proactively, intentionally be that influence. And we have to acknowledge, it does not just happen naturally. Naturally, we tend to gravitate towards people of our own age, our own life stage. And so it takes that extra effort. It takes that ex, those extra steps. And I am so encouraged because I know for a fact that here at Christ Central, those steps are taken, that there are older women who are caring for our young women. In fact, I, I'm, I've been witness to how some of the older women of this church have been even caring for a dear younger woman at Kindred, giving her all this wisdom and encouragement and even comfort. And so let this be an encouragement to you. I praise God for the ways he is already working this out in this community of influencers and models. But may we continue all the more for the sake of the health of this church. This is what makes the community healthy. When older reaches to the younger, not just women, but men and women. When we are reaching our children's generation, the next generation, But of course, part of what it means to be a good model, an influencer for the gospel, is not just modeling behavior, just modeling, this is is how you should act, but modeling motivation. Once again, I want to draw your attention to the fact that Paul starts chapter two by saying, teach what accords with sound doctrine. It all flows from that sound doctrine, that healthy teaching. And what is that sound doctrine? It's the doctrine that points us to Jesus. It's the doctrine that points us to the motivation of, I want to do these things. I want to live my life this way. I want to be an example. Not perfectly, of course. We're never going to be perfect examples. We're never going to be perfect models. But I want to do this, not because people are looking at me, not because people are judging me, but simply because I believe this doctrine. I believe this gospel. I am am moved to gratitude by what Christ has done for me. And now I want to live this out in a healthy way for my brothers and sisters. Going back to the, the, the descriptions of older men and women, Men were to be dignified, serious, grave. But the question I have for you is, serious and grave about what? You don't have to be serious and grave about everything. There's a lot of things you don't have to be serious about. There's a lot of things you can take lightly. But serious and grave about what? I would say serious and grave about all that has to do with the Lord all that has to do with his worship, all that has to do with his word, with the gospel. Likewise, women are to be reverent, fitting a temple, that temple-like behavior and actions and attitude. If you put those together, serious, grave, reverent in behavior, you put those together, all, all we're getting is this great picture of you know who God is. You know what he's like. And that colors everything you do as a community. Lately, with our daughter Emery, we've been having to teach her and and struggling to teach her as well about reverence to God. We don't use that word with her. But, you know, I've been noticing any time... We pray, not every single time, but a lot of times when we pray or when we're singing praise songs together as a family, suddenly she becomes very, very silly. 
Suddenly, my little daughter becomes, you know, starts using this weird, funny voice, this silly voice. She starts doing silly motions and gets more irreverent, actually. And I'm like, get behind me, Satan. (laughs) Why is this happening only when we pray and only when we uh, are worshiping God? And I I had to rack my brain. How do I tell her not to do that without just getting mad at her and saying, don't do that? And I thank God for the doctrines, the rich, rich doctrines we learn through our songs, through the songs of the church, the rich history of songs that have come from the church that teach us great doctrine. And I said to her, don't be silly when we pray and when we praise God. Why? Because my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty There's nothing my God cannot do. If you know that about God, don't be so silly when you're praying. Don't be so silly when you're singing. And I hope that 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 can convey it. I thank God for that song. That's why you should be reverent, Henry, because of who God is, because he's so big and so mighty, so strong. And that's important for Henry to know, but it's important for me to know too. That's important for all of us to remember. Our reverence before God is going to be what colors our influence over the next generation. I had a conversation recently with a dear friend uh, who is currently struggling with church attendance. He's, he's not feeling quite like he needs it. Um, and yet he has this dilemma because he's like, but I still want my kids to go to church. I still want them to have that foundation. <laughs> but you could see the contradiction there. And I had to remind him of something that you and I have heard many times before. It's, it's a commonly quoted phrase where what one generation views as optional, the next generation will view as unnecessary. That how we treat the church, how we treat our shared faith, how we treat our doctrine, how we treat the word of God is going to be visible. No matter what you say, no matter what you say about, oh, this is important. You need to do this. You should do that. You need to follow this. You need to believe that. But our reverence will show or lack thereof. We are called to reverence before God because of who he is, because he is holy, because he is strong and mighty, because of his infinite immensity. And to think that as we look upon this holy, three times holy God who makes people fall to their knees, who the book of Hebrews says it's a terrible thing to fall into his hands. As we look at this holy God to also think this is the big, holy, perhaps even scary God that loves me, that is tender towards me, that is gentle with me. This is the God who has sent his only son to die on the cross for me. This is the God who is merciful to me, who forgives my sin. And when we put those two together, reverence for who he is and the gratitude that comes from his grace and his gospel, how could we not influence our next generation? How can we not influence our younger brothers and our sisters for the sake of the kingdom of God? I want to close with just this little sidebar statistic. It's a little soapbox that I've gone on a few times, but I do think it's relevant to this passage and to this message. But there is a a statistic that's been going around basically about how the average age or the median age of pastors is getting older and older. And what that means for us is simply that there's not as many younger people of the next generation becoming pastors. And, you know, some people find that alarming. Perhaps we all should find it alarming. Some even go as far as to say there's a looming succession crisis for the church and for the leadership of the church. We take that seriously. 
At the same time, I don't want to be a fear monger or, you know, uh, bring doom and gloom to this message. But as we look at statistics like these, and as we ask ourselves, well, what are we to do about it? Because we know for a fact, my, my youth group brothers and sisters here, no matter how much we try to make you become pastors or missionaries or Christian counselors, frontline workers for the gospel, we can't force you to do it. Right? No one can force you to do this. But how are we going to get our next generation to want to do these things, to want to live for the kingdom? Of course, there's a multitude of ways you can live for God in all sorts of jobs. It doesn't have to be frontline Christian work, but we still need people to do that as well, to become pastors, missionaries, Christian counselors, Christian leaders. How are we going to do that? I don't have the magic bullet answer And I don't think there is one single simple answer. But I will say this. I do think, I do think that there is hope. That that we don't, that there is hope for the answer to this quote unquote succession crisis. When we create a culture, when we continue to create a culture, where we take these things seriously, where where we take the worship of God seriously, where we take the word of God, studying the word of God seriously, when we take preaching the gospel and sharing the gospel seriously. And as we demonstrate that and as we continue to be a community that displays that, once again, never perfectly, but as we display that, motivated by God's grace and his forgiveness of us and his love towards us, how could, how, why wouldn't there be more young people who do step up when, if that's the culture we're creating? If we're creating a culture where we care about God's kingdom more than our own kingdom, where we care about God's word and God's wisdom more than the world's words and the world's wisdom, when we care about the discipleship and the influence of the church to the next generation more than just letting the world and all the other messages of this world disciple the next generation. Why wouldn't there be not only more people who become pastors or missionaries, but more and more faithful believers who love the Lord, who are motivated by the gospel, and who are reverent because they know who he is. That is the call that I see from Titus chapter 2 today for this church and every church. I praise God once again for the ways that I know this is already happening here at Christ Central. And I pray that the Lord would continue that good work that he started. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful. Lord, as we see alarming statistics in the headlines and as there are always going to be attacks from Satan, from the world, from our own sinful hearts against your church. Oh Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is holy, who is mighty, who is able, who sustains and nourishes and cherishes your church. And Lord, we pray that out of that heart, as we receive that kind of love, that kind of affection, that mercy and grace from you. Lord, help us to be more and more gospel influences to our younger brothers and sisters. For the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of the name of Christ, and for the good of your people. Motivate us, Lord, by nothing else but reverence for you and gratitude for the gospel. Help us, we pray. Help Christ Central, we pray. Lord, would you be glorified and honored in this place more and more every day. We thank you for we know that you love to do this work in your church and we commit it to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.